30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a lift. Hi, everybody. So welcome to Space Camp. So my name is Amanda Gretza. I am an educator in the New York City area. Um, I work for right now the portfolio of the school. I work with Pixel Academy, a makerspace. I also work with the Girl Scouts. And my goal is to spread my love for space and all things techie and engineering to kids all over the world. So you're going to have to bear with me today because I'm very much used to teaching to an audience, but I hope that I can share some pretty cool resources for both kids and teachers, adults, parents, whoever. So the way this workshop is going to work is I'm going to share with you a variety of different videos and free open source tools and different resources that are related to space and making. And uh, again, my name is Amanda, and this is actually my lab technician, Microchip the Microfish. Uh, so we're gonna get started with a really cool activity. And it actually branches a little bit off of the activity we just did uh, in Maker Fair with Fiscal. So I'm not sure how many space fans are out there right now, but if you know anything about space missions, you know that they start off with patches. So there are these neat things called mission patches, and I'm gonna share my screen with you quite a bit throughout this workshop. So don't mind my bouncing around, but mission patches are this really neat and sort of artistic way that you can uh, share with the world what is going on in your space mission. So right now I have displayed on my screen the mission patches from Apollo and NASA. NASA. And you can see here, these are a variety of cool decorations that sort of display what was going on in their mission. So, hey, we're going to the moon, Apollo 11. Uh, I also have here the SpaceX mission patch lists. So again, these are just a variety of different uh, designs, information, cool drawings that people did that the astronauts then wore on their suits as they left the Earth. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open Piscal as well here. And this is a free open source uh, sprite editor, but I really enjoy it because it is a pixel maker. So what I will do here is just click on create a sprite. And we're going to create a mission patch for Space Camp today. So I've actually downloaded the Maker Fair art. And we're going to pop this in here to get us started. Now you can do this on your computer with any image that you like. If you would like to make a mission badge for say your, your family, or if you're in a school, you can create a mission badge for a project that you're doing or for a science fair. Doesn't matter, it's just super fun to make. And it's, it's really neat because you can not only create an aesthetic for what you're doing, but you can add little details. So right now we have our, our Maker Fair badge, right? And it's quite large. So we're gonna resize this little teeny bit. That was quite a bit. Ready to go. All right. Um, I am going to actually just start fresh here. All right, that is much, much better, much more easy to work with. Okay, so right here we have our Empire State, Empire State Maker Fair logo. So we're actually also in Space Camp. So I'm going to add a couple things that indicate we're here in Space Camp. So first, I think we should probably keep the logo as is, but I'm going to actually design over it. So as you see here to the left, there are a variety of tools that you can use to edit your workspace here. Um, and if you've ever used a pixel editor before, it's pretty straightforward. You have your pen tool, you have your paint bucket tool, eraser tool, uh, shapes, etc. 
So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to actually fill in our background. And I think that um, this blank background is just not doing it. So I'm going to click over here down at the bottom. There are your, your color palettes. So I'm going to actually stick with black for now. But as you can see, once you click on this little square here, you can pick up a color dropper that will give you anything you'd like. So boom, we have a black background for our badge. Now, I think because we're space related, it would be kind of cool if we left our logo here as sort of like the planet and mid background for the badge. I'm also going to add in just some stars. I'm just going to sprinkle in a little bit of stars all around. Now, when you are making a mission patch, the goal is to sort of encompass the things that you would like to do or that you are doing in your home or school or project, etc. So right now, Space Camp needs stars. Um, say you are working on a science fair project about a volcano or a biosphere. In that case, you wouldn't really add stars. You could add a land mass and you can add lava flowing out and then maybe the names of your teachers. Or if you worked on a project with your friends, you could put those names on the side. As we see here with some of our official badges, see? So you have your details, your background, and then the names of all of the people that are working on the projects. So back to fiscal. All right, so we've got some, some neat stars going on here. That'll kind of serve as our background. And then the goal of this workshop today is to not just expose you to open source resources, but to also help you become citizen scientists. Now, citizen science is really important and also really cool because you basically get to help out real projects that NASA and other government space organizations and not even space related organizations, but scientists in general are doing. So you're going to actually help out on real research projects that can help change the world and help us learn more about the world around us, which is amazing. So part of our citizen science, I'm going to introduce you to two different specific citizen science applications today. So the first one is actually called Target Asteroids, and it is a, a research project that allows you, the citizen, to use um, amateur telescopes or any equipment that you have to identify things in the night sky and then report back, which is really um, kind of a fun way to get involved with space, but also stay in your own backyard, which is kind of important. So. Uh, that is our first experiment. The second one that I will show you is a much more closer to home experiment. And we will actually be identifying penguins, almost like uh, a nature where's Waldo. So that is not something that we're gonna put on this badge right now, but I would like to go into the, the amateur telescope area, arena. So you're gonna have to bear with me because I'm actually not that great of an artist but I'm gonna to try to make a telescope. So I'm gonna click over here on my circle tool and make a little, a little outline right there. Okay, I kept it white so that it sort of blended in. And then I'm gonna go over it using my pen tool and Again, I am not a good artist. So this is what's fun about Piskel is that you can kind of experiment and goof off. So here is the part of my telescope. Wow, that was terrible. <laughs> so this is the part of our telescope here. Again, don't have to be a good artist, just have to make the effort, right? So I will now, See, I'm just gonna make a crazy circle right over here. Then I need to get a little bit of a clear area here. So I have this really, really goofy looking telescope. And if you're following along at home, 
please feel free to um, share in the comments any any trouble you're having using Piscal, et cetera. Okay, so I got kind of the base outline there. Neat. Now, hmm. I'm gonna, I got my, my basic area out there, but now I'm gonna actually go in and officially make some cool lines with our telescope here. And I think I want something that stands out, but is still sort of spacey looking. So I'm gonna make some actual decent lines here. So the idea here is I wanted this to look sort of rustic, right? So our mission badges, um, as you can see, they are quite literally like old school patches. So they're sewn on. So this is a fabric material. So the reason that I'm actually using this sloppy pen right now is to kind of give a background texture to what I'm making. So it will look similar to what a uh, an actual mission badge would look like. And the beauty of Piskel is that, I, I don't know if any of you attended the previous workshop, but you can actually see you can make gifts out of it, which is really neat. So if you do end up enjoying uh, Piskel and making badges, you can make a whole series of them and just go through and even make a cool gift sharing your stuff. Okay, so again, going over really sloppy lines here. And then I'm going to go back in with my circle tool, go back over the area that I was in before, kind of add a couple more circles, make this goofy little patch look a little more goofier. And let's see. I also really enjoy Piscal because you can kind of stay in the range of the colors that you're doing. So again, I have this super, super sloppy telescope-esque object. Now, the idea of uh, making it look this sloppy is to also, I work with a lot of younger kids who kind of get frustrated when they're um, when their objects don't appear as visually interesting as they should. So again, I like to keep it kind of messy and goofy and fun. So I have this messy, goofy little telescope here. That's what this is indicative of. Then we'll add our stanchion for it, right? Because a telescope has a lot of trouble standing on its own two legs. And I'm gonna make my pen size a little bigger, which you can do up here in the top left. Cool, so I have now this big goofy telescope. We're gonna neaten it up a little bit. All right, so there's my messy telescope. Now, as I mentioned, we're also going to be doing a citizen science spotlight on finding penguins. So the way that this citizen science experiment works, and the way a lot of them work, is that you actually pan through images taken by um, satellites, by fans, by scientists themselves, and you have to go through and identify what is going on in those pictures. So there's going to be a lot of NEOs or near Earth objects. If you're looking at a citizen science project that pertains mostly to space, um, we're actually going to be doing that very, very cool asteroid citizen science experiment. But this particular one about penguins is actually going through tons of images that contain landscapes full of penguins. And you need to identify the penguins and you need to identify their eggs and then obstructions in the um, in the area. And the reason this is an important experiment is because by going through these images with your human eye, you're actually helping scientists and robots and computers get better at recognizing landscapes automatically. So AI essentially. Basically, you're training and you're helping the computer's eyes to work better by using your own eyes. So it's kind of a neat thing. And also, it's really fun because I like to think of it as where's Waldo, but in this case, it's where's penguins. <laughs> they don't have striped shirts, so unfortunately. Um, anyway, so we are now going to do a really, really goofy little penguin too. So let's come over here. We're going to make, we're going to, I'm going to try to make a penguin. I don't know how successful I will be. But again, that is kind of the fun of doing the mission badges, right? Is that it's not supposed to be this amazing piece of artwork. It's supposed to represent what you're doing or what your project is at the time. So here is my part of my little penguin guy. And again, I probably should have stayed on for um, our last presenter's Piskel 
training because he was fantastic. I am much more of an amateur physical artist, but it's a very fun activity. So here is the little, the little background for our penguin. Um, I should have drawn Pengu. I have a lot of students who like Pengu. So if you are a Pengu fan, maybe next time we'll do a Pengu badge. All right. So I'm not gonna stay on this too much longer. I kind of just wanted to do a quick demo of my terrible art. And this is a wonderful experiment, especially for younger kids. Um, if you have, if you have children who are significantly like maybe preschool, kindergarten, um, they're still developing their motor skills. So I would suggest literally having them pop down a pad and paper, draw something out, and then they could also transfer that over to this graphic design program. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds, like you're doing the physical motor skills and then their digital motor skills. Um, so I'm going to stop us right here. So this is my mission badge for today's space camp. I have our penguin for citizen science. I have our telescope. Um, I didn't want to spend too much more time on this because I have a lot of shy, exciting stuff to show everybody, but I will have a link to all of these open sources back in my Maker Fair page, and you'll be able to check them out. And these are all free all the time, um, accessible basically on any kind of device. So that is why I like to work with them. But here we have our mission badge. So we're at the Maker Fair. We have our citizen science, and we are ready to go to our next topic. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment here. Um, aside from Piscal, uh, I would generally recommend kind of any pixel editor works really great for this activity. And especially one if you can upload or import an image that you already would like to use. That's always really helpful, especially with younger students, because um, then they kind of have that framework to work upon. But that is our mission badge. Now, next up, I wanted to talk about what goes on in space and why we go to space as humans. Personally, I think space is just fascinating because it is quite literally one of the final frontiers for humankind. Um, I think every human that's ever existed has looked up at the stars and thought, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. What is going on out there? Um, and currently we have a few missions in the mix. It was a really, really amazing year for space and space travel in general. Uh, we had our first ever commercial partnership launch and we also launched our set of rovers, a new set of rovers, Perseverance, and a little robot, uh, Helicopter Pal, which is just a, just a wonderful, wonderful set for mankind. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about rovers. So if you are young and you are working at home right now, um, rovers are these amazing little space robots that help us study and learn about planets especially in cases where Mars, Mars is not particularly accessible for humans. Humans can't really survive on Mars right now as we exist and with our advances in technology, but robots can. Robots are much, much less needier than human beings are, um, especially if you pop fuel cells and nuclear, <laughs> nuclear power in them, they can go for quite, quite a while. Humans are much more finicky. And when we talk about space travel, we not only have to consider literally how far our technology can take us, but how much a human being can handle. So this is where our rovers come in. And just recently, as I mentioned, we have launched the Perseverance rover, which is set to land on Mars in a few months. It takes quite a long time to get to Mars. Um, and again, another reason why it is unsuitable for human beings to make the trip currently. So what I wanna show everybody is a, it's called Seven Minutes of Terror. And I had the pleasure of actually working with a um, mission specialist that works with JPL and the imaging laboratory. And he was actually in charge of the Mars rover Curiosity and worked on MASTCAM. So if you have seen any image of Mars in the last few years that came from Curiosity, it was this gentleman and his team that actually brought those images back to Earth and shared them with the world. And he recommended this video called uh, Seven Minutes of Terror. And this explains the process of actually landing a rover on Mars. So I'm going to play that for you all now. And we are kind of gonna get into a little bit about the rovers. And then I'm gonna show you a wonderful um, NASA 
source for a Mars simulation, which is tons of fun. And again, really accessible for even younger students as it uses almost something similar to, to block-based programming. Okay. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. But it still looks crazy. So the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9 Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it'll only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side, diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky cram in the rover. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover.
crazy, really neat. I would like to suggest if you are interested in working on any sort of rover technology at home, um, there are amazing resources. And again, I'll put that into my Maker Fair page, but buying things with solar panels, motors, it's very easy to make a, a quick experimental rover with recyclable materials, bottles, et cetera, uh, especially uh, bottle caps are helpful because you can make wheels. Um, but rovers are again, very important. Robotics are basically the next step into space travel. Um, now, finally, I wanna get into what citizen science is a little bit more and how we can help. So this is our next part. Um, there is a really interesting, almost, it's not secretive, but I don't feel like a lot of people know about it. And it is called planetary defense. So just like we have uh, national defense and armies and things like that, there's actually planetary defense. And this is a group of scientists and researchers who want to protect the planet from asteroids and meteors and uh, NEOs, which I mentioned earlier, are near, near Earth objects. So. I'm gonna show you something about that as well. And then I'm gonna show you the impact of an actual meteor that landed on Earth. I will not show the whole video. It's just a teensy bit. Ian Hodges was hit by a meteorite. What time of the day was this? 1245. 1245. And this comes through the roof and hits you. She was napping when the rock crashed through her ceiling and bounced off the radio into her stomach. Because it was small, her injuries were minor, but much bigger objects have collided with Earth. 65 million years ago, a rock 10 kilometers wide slammed into the Gulf of Mexico, an event that likely caused dinosaurs to go extinct. Elsewhere, mammoth meteorites have been discovered everywhere from the US to Russia and blasted craters in North America, Australia, and Africa. Falling objects from the sky have always fascinated humans, but they have also made us fearful, making us wonder whether someday a giant asteroid could come for us. In movies like Deep Impact and Armageddon, those fears are played out, and heroes save the day. We all gotta die, right? I'm the guy who gets to do a save in the world. You might think this only happens in Hollywood, but that's not exactly true. There is a small chance, a really, really small chance of a large asteroid hitting Earth. So scientists are getting ready, just in case. Asteroids are hunks of rock that weren't big enough to become planets when the solar system formed. Smaller asteroids are called meteoroids, and when they fall through Earth's atmosphere, they become meteors. If they make it to the surface, they're called meteorites. Between 1988 and 2017, NASA counted over 700 fireballs created by objects entering our atmosphere. In order to detect asteroids, NASA takes multiple pictures of the night sky and uses computers to scan for moving objects. As Earth orbits, scientists make several observations from different locations to detect how close the asteroids are to Earth. Here, the nearest objects are labeled in green. At least 16,000 of them have been classified as near Earth meaning they orbit within roughly a third of the distance from the sun. And based on the object's speed and brightness, scientists can map a trajectory to predict whether it will collide with Earth. The impact energy of a 10 meter object, just a little smaller than a school bus, would be 100 kilotons. But the larger the object, the nastier the impact. A meteorite just a little larger than the Great Pyramid at Giza at about 150 meters would generate 288 megatons of energy. For reference, the number of megatons in the payload of the Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb was only 15. But asteroids don't need to hit Earth to cause damage. In 2013, a 17 meter wide meteor exploded over Chelyabinsk, Russia before it ever reached the ground and the resulting shockwave released about 440 kilotons of energy that damaged structures and injured over 1,500 people. Following that event in Russia, U.S. politicians called on NASA to ask about the threat of future collisions. Well, if we saw one coming toward Omaha, uh, what could they do about it? And they said they could use a laser. First of all, it would not be practical to have a laser powerful enough to split it in half. Their questions sounded like plot lines for a new blockbuster, but their ideas weren't actually that far off. 
uh, how far inland could a you know a reasonably sized asteroid make water come in Scientists have analyzed how asteroid impacts would kill people, and getting hit by the ejecta, meaning space rock and other debris it kicks up, is one of the least likely ways to die. The most lethal cause is violent wind generated by the impact blast, followed by scorching heat and massive tsunamis. The odds of a near-Earth object strike causing massive casualties and destruction of infrastructure are very small, but the potential consequences are so large that it makes sense to take the risk. So I'm going to stop us there. Basically, there are still the, this, these threats. Of, this is not a crazy Armageddon-esque uh, level threat, but it is something that we are paying attention to as scientists, as earthlings. And there's also a lot of really interesting ways that we can study things like this. So I would like to bring your attention to uh, Google Earth, which is a very uh, engaging and interesting way to check out what is a large meteor crater site. So I have Google Earth open. Again, this is something that is a little bit more common, but I will, of course, add this to the resources. And if we take a peek here, I can actually search directly for it, and it's going to bring us in to the crater. Now, as we're rotating here, you can see this is an enormous impact that was made. And they actually use this meteor crater, if you look over here, as um, a study site, a research center. So this is still active to this day. And this is actually something that you can go visit in Arizona. So this is a, a, a quite a thousands and thousands of years old impact, but we are still using it today to learn about meteors, to learn about their effect on our planet. And again, Google Earth, always a really just a neat tool. You can poke around here, see what's going on, zoom in, et cetera. And that will bring us to citizen science. So this is the basic citizen science uh, website. This is citizenscience.gov. And this is a really useful resource because you can not only search by areas and kind of check out research projects that are nearby you, but you can also search by your interest. So right now we can view by field of science and I'm gonna click on astronomy in space. And there is a ton, a ton of different stuff. Um, I actually wanna highlight this specific citizen science experiment that can be done all across the globe. Um, so recently I did a space intensive, similar to this space program, but just over the course of about a week and a half with a group of third and fourth graders at the portfolio school in New York City. And what we did was we actually created our own rovers using solar panels, motors, fans, and um, recyclable supplies, as well as 3D printed parts. So the kids did the same thing that we kind of just went through. Um, they designed their own mission patches, which were much better than mine. Um, then we went through and learned about rovers. We spoke with that scientist that I previously mentioned who works for um, with JPL and um, on the Curiosity Mast Camp. And then we went and we did some citizen science of our own. So back world, uh, Backyard World's Planet Nine is a really cool experiment. And I'm gonna bring you to this website as well. So essentially we're looking beyond Neptune for new planets, brown dwarfs, and we're kind of combing through images to find NEOs. So just like they just mentioned in the video, as I mentioned earlier, these are you know our near earth objects. Um, so we're going back to, again, teaching imaging software to look for what could be a new planet. So if you take a peek here, there are notes. You can actually talk to other people that are doing the experiment. But essentially, it's about classifying objects and images. And as you can see here, you can, you're going to actually click and identify the different things that you see on these, this huge catalog of images. This is pretty, pretty straightforward. I would recommend this for a little bit of an older group, as you do have to be a bit careful about the pictures that you're seeing. There can be a lot of different markers that are sort of tough to differentiate. But I will then bring you to this other citizen science experiment, which is much, much more accessible for kids of all ages, um, people of all ages. Uh, this is the one that I referred to earlier as the 
Penguin, where's Waldo? So this is called Penguin Watch, and this is on Zooniverse. So Zooniverse is a pretty big citizen science website as well. This is funded by um, government, NASA, et cetera. But what I have open here is another imaging experiment where you have to go through and identify penguins. So as you can see, it is a little bit easier to do than to mark on our, our backyard worlds. So although we're not looking for a planet, we are looking for penguins. So as you see here, um, we have, it's really straightforward with the tutorial, it will tell you you're just individually marking adult penguins, chicks, and eggs. And as you're doing that, you are helping teach computers, you're helping teach robots how to do this on their own. So it is really vital, vital help. Um, so right now I'm just gonna go through and oh, we have some penguins. What I thought at first was kind of funny is it's tough to identify the ones in the background. So you can see them, but it is a teensy, teensy bit far off. So we have to decide, is that going to be part of our identifying process? I think for the most part, the rules are, if you can see it well enough that you can identify it, then you can absolutely count it and you can mark it. In this case, I don't see any eggs. I don't see any chicks. I just see adult penguins. And then I see stuff in the background. So I'm not gonna actually classify these things, although I'm pretty sure they might be penguins. It's not official and we don't want to confuse our research. So I'm going to say, yes, I have marked these moons. This one's a little bit easier. You have a contrast in the background here, but here we go. Just identifying some penguins. And that was it. And so in doing this action, I am helping participate. I am a scientist here and I welcome all of you to be a scientist with me. Finally, I will show you the asteroid citizen science project. Now this is a little bit more complicated. Um, obviously this one you can't jump in as quickly as you could with our backyard worlds or our pen penguin watch experiment. But if you do have a telescope at home, I absolutely welcome you to come and check this out as well. This is going to be a little bit more of a um, space specific and involved project where you're actually looking for asteroids. You're tracking things in the night sky with your own eyes and then reporting back and helping collect like this massive amount of data that will help with our NEOs. And then finally, this is not a citizen science experiment, but there is something called NASA's Eyes, which you can download for free on the NASA website. And it is a fully fledged out app that actually allows you to check out past experiments, past um, missions, and go from the perspective of the shuttles, of the equipment themselves, and check out space, check out the planets, check out anything they were looking at. So it's this really engaging way to sort of um, put pictures to these really expansive missions. And um, yeah, I think that is all we have today for Space Camp. So I just wanted to say thank you all so much for tuning in and I appreciate everybody. And if you are interested in becoming a scientist yourself, check out citizenscience.gov. Um, NASA has resources and there's just a ton of stuff that you can do to help make the world a safer and more spacey place. All right, so thank you so much for coming today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can send me an email. My website is just amandagrutza.com. I would be happy to answer any questions. I will put up all of my curriculum, um, everything that I've used, all the resources. Again, it's all open source and I'm all about helping get more space curriculum into classrooms and having fun engaging projects for kids and adults of all ages. So thank you so much. Happy Maker Fair.